Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanante. Hi, this is Mike Passanante, and we are glad you are back on board for another episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. Today, I am joined again by Cindy Kowalski, who is a manager in our compliance services team here at Bessler Consulting. Welcome back, Cindy. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here again. So today, Cindy is going to walk us through some of the common mistakes and challenges associated with physician documentation. So in a previous podcast, um, we talked about essential components of physician documentation and coding. And Cindy, let me throw it to you. Can you share some of your experiences with common mistakes and and challenges around those elements? Certainly, Mike. To ensure that a medical record and its documentation is accurate, it's important to follow certain principles. One is that your record, your medical record, is complete and legible. That the documentation of this patient encounter should include the reason for the encounter, history, physical exam, prior test results, diagnostic test results, an assessment, clinical impression, diagnoses, a medical plan of care, and the date and identity of the person performing the exam. I think it's important when we think about some of the challenges and the common mistakes, a lot of them have to do with omission. Um, We're just not including them. And and they could be past and present diagnoses. Um, Maybe the patient is being treated by another physician. You want to be sure that they are documented in the medical record, regardless of who's treating. You want to be sure that all of the appropriate health risk factors have been identified. The patient's been screened and the factors have been identified. You want to be sure that the patient's um, progress, uh, response, or or any change in the treatment um, is also documented. And I think what's important as I go through some of these common mistakes and challenges is probably to count how many times I talk about documentation um, because documentation is a significant component of, of, of all of this. So I want to focus down on each element around documentation. So can you first describe for us specifically what you see? Generally through education and training, when um, through a, an acquisition or uh, medical staff education, if we're performing coding audits um, based on that dialogue with physicians, with coders, with billers, we generally hear what some of those challenges are. So we're able to glean that information, if you will. In addition, um, through our own monitoring of records as well as audits, Um, we have been able to, over time, track and trend exactly uh, what we see as as high-priority areas, if you will. Okay, so let's start with history and and go through some of those common mistakes that you find in that area. Sure. I think some challenges um, specifically around the element of history – have to do with the history of of the present illness. And it's really rather basic. Um, The history of present illness is is just not completed. It's it's not completely documented. Um, Again, and more of an act of omission, um, it's important that there be a means to capture all of this type of information. We also see... um, incomplete documentation. Um, And what I mean by that is this incomplete documentation that is not gathered on the initial visit 
is then used to determine the next level of visit. But if you think about missing information, you're really not establishing what that appropriate plan of care is. What we also see around um, history of present illness is a uh, basic or, or simply listing of chronic conditions um, without providing any actual um, status per the patient. Um, I see that you have a history of asthma, but how are they doing? Is it managed? You have a history of hypertension. Yes, it's managed. Um, you have a history of diabetes. Yes, but my blood sugars are going up and down. Simply listing um, the additional um, conditions is, is not enough. You want to give some additional detail, if you will, to what is the status of, of that. When we talk about um, review of systems, and we've, we've talked in a previous podcast about the complexity, if you will, of or the necessity of re- doing a complete review of systems. And certainly if a patient comes in uh, with a problem-focused type of history, I, I injured my elbow, um, I would expect that there is a, a, an assessment or a view of their extremities. Um, and, and generally what we see is it's either um, a minimal review of the systems or completely absent. Um, within the note. Now, again, that's not to say that that review wasn't performed. It's the question then is why did did it make to did it make it to the actual documentation? And then, lastly, around history has to do with the um, past family, social history, things like that. And I think it's the language that's used. Um, if you think about. Um, evaluating past medical history, family history, um, oftentimes you'll see a notation from a provider that says non-contributory. Um, generally with the arrow covering all, all questions, one response. Um, and the first question is, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, wh- what was the intent of, of that statement? And I think the easy takeaway is non-contributory is probably not sufficient, um, especially someone that has um, comorbidities. Y- you want to understand what the relationship is, is their family members, surgical history, social histories, um, things like that. So you want to start building your picture, building your puzzle, and start putting these pieces together. So those, those are some of the things we see around history. So moving along to examination, can you discuss some of the common mistakes associated with that area? Sure. Um, I think some important points um, as far as documentation uh, when you talk about the exams, um, specific abnormal or relevant negative findings of the exam of the affected or symptomatic body area should be documented. Um, And what I mean by that is Simply noting abnormal um, without any additional elaboration or documentation is is not su- sufficient. Um, so again, focusing on expanding that information, paint that picture for us. Any abnormal or unexpected findings of an area that was asymptomatic. Um, example, I came in due to an injury to my elbow. Uh, however, in, in reviewing the limited review of systems, you also note that there's, you know, significant range of motion issues in my other arm. Um, again, it's not necessarily what I came in for today. However, it is still an unexpected or, or not normal finding. So again, that information, that piece of data should also be added to the record. In addition, um, a brief statement or an or a notation indicating negative or normal is okay if you're documenting the findings f- related to an unaffected area. Example, going back to our elbow issue, you know, other extremities are normal, meaning that there is nothing else significant significant there. 
one, uh, I guess, word of caution with that in writing a negative or a normal, it is not necessarily um, appropriate uh, to label an entire organ system as negative. You, you, you should provide, you know, a little bit more detail. Certainly looking, you know, when you're doing a multi-system exam, um, one broad label, if you will, of normal or negative is, is probably not supporting the documentation. You should provide that additional detail. Um, again, going back, I think um, documentation as a whole, um, as it relates to exams, generally we see a lot of lack of, lack of um, information. A lot of this, and, and we actually will talk about this in the future, in the near future, um, a lot of the documentation and what might be missing or not, not available could be, not necessarily is, but could be attributed to the electronic health records where there has been the development of templates and drop-down screens and things like that, which can limit the additional free text ability, if you will, to, to provide the additional information. And sometimes it's, it's simply not documenting that an exam was even performed, just moving right past it. I think uh, another area that we see some challenges is the mixing of body, uh, of body areas or organs um, basically to meet a specific E&M level. Um, again, if you're looking for that comprehensive level, the more complex, um, and there's a multitude of organ systems that were reviewed when in fact perhaps the patient only came in complaining of an upper respiratory infection, um, it's not necessarily more, more documentation means, you know, a higher level if it doesn't fit why the patient came in in the first place. And then lastly, we talk a lot about um, the electronic records um, or templates and checkboxes. Um, a lot of organizations... Um, prior to the electronic health record would have um, templates where you can go down and do a review of systems and it's check yes, check no, check yes, check no. Um, however, checking a abnormal box and not elaborating exactly what you mean, you know, normal, abnormal, you check abnormal, not elaborating on that is not going to benefit as far as the, you know, the coding and, and, and reimbursement. So I think those are, those are some challenges we see around um, examination. So what do you see around medical decision-making? Some of the challenges with medical decision-making has to do on the uh, severity and the number of the problems. Um, you, You cannot base your sole reason for medical decision-making on the severity or or just the number. Um, this patient has 10 um, comorbidities. Um, by virtue of a high number, doesn't necessarily get you a higher level uh, E&M. Um, you, you have to include all of the components for each of the diagnoses. So it's not just simply a, a list. Um, Another area that, that could be a challenge is the, the orders. Um, orders that are not documented or listed with at, without any correlation or relationship to the problem or the plan is not helpful. Um, the orders need to reflect why something is being ordered um, why, what the thinking is behind it, what the, um, what the outcome is that you're concerned about, what the risk perhaps is that you're, that you're concerned about. And, and I think it's important to consider this. An order, an order without a reason would be considered, could be considered medically unnecessary. Um, so when you think about an order for a reason, 
order this for that, order this for that. It certainly um, assists, if you will, in the documentation to support exactly what the provider is thinking. Another area um, that we, we, look, we look at is the diagnosis. Um, and what I mean by that is lack of specificity um, in the document from the physician. We see the diagnosis coding on the claim um, that is actually more specific than the actual documentation. So it really needs to go the other way. The documentation is there to support a diagnosis, and then the, this, this case, this claim is coded based on that documentation. Another area, in fact, related to documentation are is procedures that are performed in the office. Um, we do see a lot of lack of, I, I want to say lack of documentation or insufficient documentation provided for procedures that were performed in the office setting. Patient comes in, they have a office-based procedure, and there's no no documentation whatsoever. We would not have even known the procedure was performed. And I think lastly, um, which has to do again with documentation, is the actual authentication. Um, the author, the provider who's actually performing um, the, the exam, the documentation, is, is not signing. Sounds hard to believe, but, but we do see a lot of that. Lack of authentication. And in all of this, legibility is still a common concern. I'm afraid so. Legibility, until we go completely away from a paper record, if you will, um, will continue to be um, an issue. There are um, some organizations through the years who have, in order to facilitate or try to lessen the number of illegible uh, entries, uh, even around um, physician signatures, where they will assign a number to the physician. Um, so the physician, you may not be able to read a signature, but you may see provider number one, two, three, where I may not know who the signature is, but I do have a means to look up who provider one, two, three is. Um, some organizations have gone to stamps in addition to the actual signatures so that they they go together, um, but yes, uh, legibility has been and probably will continue to be for some time now um, a a documentation issue. And date and time documentation that that can al- actually impact compliance as well. Correct? Absolutely. Dating and timing um, have long been challenges. Um, again, the. Um, the electronic record with its automatic timestamps um, certainly does help. Um, and in an office setting, um, you may or may not have that option as well as, as in, a, in a hospital. Um, but the dating and the timing of, of both the, um, the treatment and or the signatures, if, if for some reason they're different, is imperative. Because, again, you're showing your, the flow, the chronological flow of the care for this, for this patient. So, Cindy, you did a, a great job over the last several minutes laying out lots of different common mistakes that can occur. Um, how do these mistakes affect accurate physician documentation and coding? These mistakes will impact the ability of an organization or a provider to prepare and submit a clean claim, an accurate, concise claim for reimbursement. If it is not, if the information is not available, if for whatever reason it, 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 it's just not sufficient, what happens is the claim is then returned, returned to provider, and you literally go through the process again. So there's, there's, there could be a revenue issue, a reimbursement issue. Um, if you have to keep resubmitting claims, um, our adage is always do it right the first time, and it'll it'll be a smoother 
operation, if you will. Um, so again, there could be delay on on adjudicating a claim, which could have an effect on your revenue flow. Um, you could have an increased number of denials. We all know that increased number of denials could be a red flag. Um, so the, those are probably the top two that that are significant. I'm going to ask you just to provide some parting advice for our audience. What do you think they should know about handling these physician documentation and coding challenges? I think the most important would be educate, educate, educate. Um, there, there probably can never be enough education. We assume um, that physicians have all of the education knowledge um, based on their training to, to document. And, and I think what's important when we think about education is we're not questioning the, the um, medical decision-making, what went into making that clinical decision. But when we educate, what we're talking about is help me understand what we could do differently to capture everything in your head, if you will, so that we can paint a clear, concise picture of this patient, what your concerns are, what contributed to those concerns, how you developed your plan of care, what are some of the things you're worried about with this patient. Um, it's really to establish a win-win. We're, we're not here to, from an education standpoint and auditing standpoint, we're not necessarily looking at, oh, you know, this physician does it well, this physician doesn't do it well. The idea of education is to help me help you. I want to send and submit a clean claim, turn it around quickly, get the payment to turn that revenue over. And I need to be able to work with the physicians to develop whatever tools are necessary to gather all of that information the first time. So I think the takeaway would be constant education. Auditing, if there are, if there are physicians that are doing well, I think it's important to tell them that they're doing well. If there are physicians that are challenged, I say go back and educate again and again and again. Um, because, again, it will be a win-win for everyone. Cindy, thanks for spending some time with us and illuminating the common mistakes associated with physician documentation. Thanks, Mike. For more information, download our ebook on physician coding and compliance at Bessler.com forward slash physician compliance. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler Consulting. 